the next uh, time period is to present some of the physics and the biology of drying hay. And uh, hopefully there are a few things that you can pick out of this. So one thing I want to say up front is there's no one right way to do things, okay? Can you, oh, I got to get this right up front. Thank you. I, you know, I noticed that with John. But anyway, um, I'll try to hold it high and some of you in the back raise your hands if I kind of drift away or something. The other thing though is um, I do want to encourage you to talk back to me as we're going along this morning. Uh, disagree, <laughs> ask a question if I'm not clear on something, but uh, please speak up as we're going. We won't wait till the end. I know if I try to do that, I've either forgotten the question or I don't care anymore. So uh, please do ask as we go along. Uh, start with this first. Um, first, I just want to <laughs> maybe meddle a little bit, but I think it's important for us to uh, keep in mind as, as farmers and myself included, we all tend to be a bit penny wise and pound foolish. And I think we should seriously analyze our situation to ask about that. Uh, for example, how many of us won't drive 20 miles to save a few cents on a gallon of gas? Now, maybe not you guys, but your neighbors would, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> and I think we really need to think about, uh, you know, are we in some cases maybe being a little bit penny wise and pound foolish? There are two things I think that particularly pertain to this. Um, the first is a failure to uh, establish uh, or remove endophyte infected tall fescue. I know that's been something we've discussed for the years, but really when you look at the advantage of the novel endophyte, and this is some data from Alabama, uh, their cows had an increased 107 pounds at weaning if it was on novel endophyte. They had an increased pregnancy rate of 41%. How many of you are not having trouble getting your cows pregnant again? Um, the calf weaning weight was 68 pounds. You know, that alone would pay for reseeding. And then JB tells me there's some federal support for some of that too. You could make money reseeding to novel endophyte. And I think you should really think about that when you look at, you don't want to invest the money, but you're willing not to have your cattle do as well as they could. And that's something that we maybe can't tolerate anymore in this day and age. The, sec the third thing I want to follow up with and uh, it would just address this at the end of the last talk, is failure to fertilize. You know your land rent is the same whether you fertilize or not. Your land rent is the same whether you get one or two tons off that field, right? The harvesting cost is the same whether you're harvesting one or two tons of hay. The only thing is it's a few more trips to the barn with the hay wagons, but it's basically same to mow, same to rake, similar to bale. And so I think it really is important to think about fertilizing. And the key thing to think about too is it's even more crucial in a hay making or a baleage making process. Because if you're grazing cattle on an area for example, most of the potassium goes back on the pasture, comes out in the urine of the cows because there's not potassium in the meat or whatever you're taking off that field. But it will leave the field with the hay. And so as you're making hay on fields, and here's just some kind of average uh, nutrient content of grass uh, hay, I'd like you to consider that every ton you bale, you took this much off the field, and you need to ask yourself, are you going to put up with less yield the next time or are you going to replace this and have a continued high yield on that acreage that you're harvesting? So just a couple things about, I, I would say, being penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, we have a lot of farmers too that skimp on the fertilizer and then put up with less yield off their field. And I'm not sure that's a wise decision in many cases. But think about that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about drying hay. And again, this pertains to both hay and baleage. Uh, the principles are all the same. And the first thing that I want to uh, start with is 
the importance of a wide swath. Oh, I see, you know, my batteries are running out. We've been using this. Um, do you have any AAA batteries? I do not. Uh, well, I'll have to get some. Anyway, um, the, uh, think about this. There's a yeah. There. Can you use <laughs> um, A wide swath is the single most important thing in drying hay. If you think about it, and the reason is that uh, the <coughs> first and most important factor in drying anything is sunlight. So in this case, we're intercepting a little over 90% of the sunlight on that field and using it to dry our hay. In this case, we're only intercepting about a third of the sunlight and using it. So when we make a wind roll, we're not using a lot of the sunlight that's falling on that field that could be used to dry our hay. Just think about it. Now, the other thing, think about how many of you have any clotheslines at your home or farm? A couple of you? Well, you know, when you have a clothesline, you take the shirt and you hang it up in a, a single flat layer on that clothesline, right? Now, if somebody took that shirt and bent it four or five times, like we would condition hay, and then threw it in a pile on the ground and complained because that shirt didn't dry, you'd probably have something to say to them, wouldn't you? <laughs> but that's what we do when we put hay in a windrow. We bunch it up, we reduce the sunlight that hay receives, and then we complain because it doesn't dry fast enough. Now, um, as, as you're looking at your own haymaking equipment, you may not be able to go to a swath that covers 100%. <coughs> but I would suggest that all of you can open the deflectors on the back of your uh, mowers and make a wider swath. In some cases, you can take the deflectors off. It may catch on the wheels, but in some cases, you can actually take the deflectors off. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that there, there is a company that makes little pieces of angle iron you can put on the back deflector that will spread the hay out again. So you could, you know, if it comes out of the back of yours and you can only cover 60% of the cut area, you could maybe just bolt on those little deflectors and spread it out some more. You can get there. The other thing I would say <coughs> is with this wide swath, you have to drive on the wind roll. You drive on one swath when you cut the next one, right? You know, that's what we used to do years back before we had conditioners. You had sickle bars. You probably remember, there aren't many people as old as I am here, but <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. But when you cut with a sickle bar mower without a conditioner, you just let it fall back behind that cutter bar in a wide swath, and then you drove over it. First off, it dried faster. But Think about driving over it. Now, one of the other options to going with 100% swath, like in the picture, if you get up to 70 or 80% of the cut area with your swath, thank you. Um, if you get up to 70 or 80% of the cut area with your swath, then you can oftentimes, with a pull-type mower, drive one wheel in between the swaths, and the other wheel goes in the middle, and there isn't as much hay in the middle of a swath as there is on either edge of a swath. So you're really not driving over much. But again, I come down to, you have to ask yourself, which way are you doing the lesser damage? Making a wind roll or driving over the swath? But at any rate, oh, thank you. I don't know about you, but this, uh, this little red pointer on here doesn't show up very well. But even though I got the wrong color, this green pointer shows up real nice when I want to get something. So anyway, um, so think about with a wide swath, we're using Mother Nature to dry our hay. We're intercepting a large percentage of the sunlight, and sunlight is the first and foremost factor in drying anything. Now, when we look at weather factors and uh, how much 
influence they have. Uh, this table shows solar radiation, relative humidity, air temperature, soil moisture content, and swath density. These are the five big factors. What's the other factor you usually think about in drying hay? That's not on my list. Well, there's some really good blank stairs out there, you know? <laughs> Come on. Wind speed, right? Wind speed is important. It's just not one of the top five. Think about that. But the thing that I want to point out to you is if we look at the factors affecting drying, the single biggest factor is solar radiation, which if you look at the right side there, there's 48 hours difference between the minimum and maximum, between a cloudy day and a bright sunny day. Two days difference in drying, whether or not the sun is shining. That is the single biggest factor, unless you're putting it in a wind row and not using the sunlight. <clears throat> but relative humidity makes about uh, 3.9 hours difference. Temperature, surprisingly, isn't that important. Uh, whether you're at 70 degrees or 90 degrees doesn't have a large influence on drying rate. Soil moisture is not so important. One of the reasons many farmers are worried about making a wide swath is they don't want to put it over a wet soil. Again, that's not what I prefer to do, but it's better to put it over a wet soil than it is not to spread it out. You have to ask yourself is which is the least problem? And the least problem is making, is putting it over wet soil. A greater problem is putting it in a windrow. Think about that. But then the other thing, the, the second biggest factor that makes about seven to eight hours difference is swath density. And again, you control that. Are you going to put it in a swath or are you going to put it in a dense windrow and slow it down? Think about that. Now, you all have seen this. Here's a windrow that was made, um, mode, condition, and put in a windrow. And you come back the next morning, and you all have done this. You turn over that windrow, and it's just as green underneath as when you cut it, right? Hadn't dried a bit. And so, again, that's the function of a windrow. Now, one of the reasons it doesn't dry in that windrow, I've done a lot of measurements on this, and inside that windrow, in about 15 to 20 minutes, that humidity inside that windrow gets up to 95% or higher. Now, does stuff dry much when it's 95% humidity? Well, no. And, and so we're making a windrow, we're creating that humid environment, and then we're complaining because our hay won't dry. Just like the person throwing the sheet in a pile on the ground and complaining because it doesn't dry. <laughs> so we have measured that humidity inside. Now the other thing about drying, so I talked about the importance of, of sunlight in terms of giving the energy for drying, but the other important factor is that the leaves all have holes primarily on the bottom. We uh, call those stomates. And those stomates open during the day and let water out to cool the leaf, and they close in the dark at night. <coughs> okay, now, if you put that hay in a windrow, is it in the light or in the dark? Let's see, somebody in the third row. Light or the dark? dark. Yeah, see, <laughs> this is not rocket science, is it? <laughs> but. So when you have those stomates closed, you then have that leaf between two layers of wax. Is that going to dry very well? Or would it dry better with the holes open? So I want you to think about that. So again, a wide swath lets that hay be in the sunlight, lets the stomates stay open, and the leaves will dry. Really crucial. Now. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and, and we'll come back to this as we do baleage, when you cut your hay, almost irregardless of what it is, whether it's a small grain, Bermuda grass, a cool season, tall fescue, whatever, it's between 75 and 80 percent water. Now, when you look at that, the first 20 percent water 
you could lose from the leaves, and it's really controlled by the stomate openings. So if we are going to make baleage at 60%, and I saw a few of you were thinking about it, stem a bit for haylage or baleage. Now for hay, you obviously need to dry the stem, and then conditioning becomes important, and then we have the other uh, weather and osmotic cell forces involved. But think about losing that first 15 to 20 percent water. The other thing, well, and I'll just show you. Here is uh, an example of one of the many trials that we did. Here is a swath that was covered 61% of the cut area, and remember, I'm telling you 70 or 80. And here's a windrow that we made that covered 27%. It basically, am I out of time already? <laughs> I'm worried when you stand up, John. <laughs> um, the 27% uh, was basically a four foot wide swath from a 13 foot mower, right? And uh, what you see is that it took us an extra day to dry that hay down to about 20% moisture. <coughs> We'd actually want to go a few degrees drier. Uh, it was ready on day two if we made a wide swath, but it didn't get ready till late on day three. And that was kind of typical of a lot of the trials that we did. Now, the other side of this though, is if you're making baleage, and I'm gonna recommend that you bale at about 60% moisture, with a wide swath, we mowed in the morning at about nine o'clock and we got down to 60% moisture at about three in the afternoon. So you could wrap it the same day that you cut it. Now I don't know, I haven't looked at your weather patterns in detail, but I did spend a few years in South Carolina, and what I remember is that the rain fronts come through every three or four days. Now, I actually have some areas in Wisconsin where during the cutting period in the spring, we never have more than one day without rain. It comes through every two days. <laughs> and if you tried to make hay, you know that if you put it in a windrow and it takes three or four days, there's a pretty good chance it's going to rain in, in that period or at the end of the fourth day. But if you can get it up in one or two days, you can get in between the rain showers and you can put up higher quality hay. Now, the, uh, the other thing that's important though, in a wide swath, and losing that first 15 to 20% water, I would like to suggest to you, whether you're making hay or baleage, you have two benchmarks. Everybody thinks about how fast did I get the hay up. But really the first important one is, how fast did I lose the first 15% water? Because when you cut that hay, no matter what the crop is, and it's wet, that plant continues to respire. It's taking the starch and the sugars and breaking them down and giving off carbon dioxide. Starches and sugars are essentially 100% digestible, right? So every bit that is respired, I know it's 98, but anyway. <laughs> um, if um, every bit that is respired is lost weight, yield, and is lost quality, right? This is why we recommend cutting in the morning, even though the starch content's lower, because we can get it to 60% by the end of the day, and then if we're gonna leave it for hay, what the, the situation is, that respiration continues after the plant is cut until it dries down to about 60% water. So if you can get it dried down to 60% water, you've essentially shut off respiration. Not quite, but for the most part. That's why if you cut in the afternoon and it doesn't get dried down to 60%, it continues to respire all night. If you put it in that windrow like I showed you with that green material overnight, that all respired all night. You lost starch and sugar from that wind roll. Think about that. So respiration is something that we want to shut down. The way that we do it is to try to lose that first 15% water. 
The respiration losses in harvesting can be, according to literature, between 2 and 8 percent. Now, I don't think you're on the high end here. I think that's only in the western states. But uh, I would suggest that you're probably losing 4 to 6 percent due to respiration if you put the hay in the windrow and leave it wet overnight. Does that make sense to everybody? How about you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then, so not only is it a yield loss, but it's a loss of TDN. Now, um, so the two benchmarks that you should think about in making hay or silage, the first one is how to lose the first 15% water as quickly as possible. And then the second one, obviously, is how soon does it get dry enough to bale for either hay or baleage. Now, here's an example I just took uh, from some of our hay sales. And I think your prices are not too different here. I took a moderate price. But if, if we figure a 4% loss due to respiration at uh, $150 a ton hay, you're basically losing $6 per ton. That's the cost of making a windrow instead of a wide swath. You with me on that? Now, that's just the yield loss. If we come look at the quality loss and the cattle you're feeding, I assumed here that we started at about 40% uh, NDF. This is alfalfa, but we see the same thing with grasses. Uh, if we lose 4% uh, starch, that increases the fiber, and that lowers the value of that hay. In this example, $24. So you lost $30 just because you put it in a wind row instead of a wide swath per ton. That's quite a bit. <laughs> and I think if you look towards feeding your cattle, you'll see that that, that uh, works out that way, that you're, you've got the extra energy if you made a wide swath, and you've got the extra yield. Comments or questions or disagreements? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, my hearing is bad. <laughs> yes? We, have, we are hearing that, and it might be beyond the scope of what you're talking about, that UV breaks down ergovaline in our Kentucky 31. Is, that, is this the part of the process where that happens? Uh, no, but I'll talk about that in Bailey's this afternoon. Okay. So. Got me on a cord too here, which is a problem. <laughs> you know, uh, I've got hearing aids. Uh, one of the problems of getting old and being around farm machinery all my life, I think, is losing my hearing a little bit. And one of the things that happens when you lose your hearing is you lose the ability to hear high pitched voices. So it means you can't hear women as well as men. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am, but I, it's really true. And that's why I had to get you up here. Um, I have to say that it makes it a lot more peaceful around my house. Um, on the other hand, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and I cannot for the life of me hear what she's saying to me, and I just hate that. I always have to get her mother to repeat it, and, and they've learned to kind of talk in uh, low pitch voices so I can hear them. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so her question was about the uh, ergovaline, and, uh, and does that relate to this? And no, it doesn't. We'll talk about that on baleage a little bit later on today. That was a good question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Keep asking again, even though I've got the hearing issue, everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so I'll say it just quickly now. One of the things we've learned is that if we make haylage or baleage at 60% moisture, we don't need conditioners on our mowers. Makes them cheaper, makes them go faster, <laughs> uh, and is some advantage. But if you're going to make hay, you absolutely need conditioners. Absolutely. So um, there's two kinds of conditioners, the flail or the impellers, like you see here. Uh, and then the uh, roller, intermeshing rolls, conditioners. 
The um, flailers or impellers operate by scraping the stems, uh, to scrape the wax to allow the stem to dry. The uh, intermeshing rollers work by breaking the stems. And I'll just say right now, the flail conditioners were designed for grass and work best for that. And how many of you have flail conditioners on your mowers? Okay, how many have roller conditioners? How many make alfalfa hay? Okay, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, the impellers are designed for uh, grass hay. They were invented for Europe and developed for that where they put up a grass. The intermeshing rollers are really beneficial for legumes like alfalfa. Either one will cause grass hay to dry equally as well. And I'm looking at a dealer here, but I'll tell you, I get calls from farmers all the time. They call me and say, which one dries hay better? And I always say, which one is the guy trying to sell you? <laughs> because, and, and this is an important lesson though, because his machine is maybe properly adjusted and yours is probably not. And the biggest factor in conditioning is the adjustment of the machine by the operator. So, um, so anyway, we have the two different uh, methods of conditioning. Uh, how do you tell if your conditioning good enough? How many of you, let's start with, how many of you ever change the settings on your conditioner? One, two, three. Three out of the whole crowd? Oh, four, okay. <laughs> so, every one of you should be. The conditioning should be changed for whenever you have a yield difference among fields. The conditioning should be changed when you go from one crop to another. <coughs> Not always, but it might take different settings. So, let's look about impeller conditioner. How do you tell if you're doing good enough? There weren't too many of you, but uh, Let's think about it. So again, it's caused by rubbing or abrasions of the uh, impeller fingers that scrape the wax off the stem. Um, and, and the criteria would be that, <laughs> and, and I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you this one, but I strongly encourage that when you pull in the field of the mower conditioner, you mow 30 or 40 feet and get off and look at how does it look behind the mower. Most people never do that. <laughs> I was on one field someplace in a different country, and they had three gangs on a mower. A guy pulled out in the field and started, and he didn't even notice one gang wasn't working. Um, so it's important to get off and look at your mower after a few feet and see how you're doing. How do you tell if the impeller is set properly? Um, basically, all of the stems should show some scraping or mechanical embrasion. If, if most of the stems do, you're okay. If all of them do, maybe you could loosen it up a little bit. You adjust an impeller conditioner by uh, adjusting the deflector back behind the impellers. The more you put it down, the harder it conditions, the more horsepower it takes, the more you raise it up, the lighter it does. So I would suggest always, when you start a new field, do a few feet, get off and look at it, and you would like most, but not all of the stems to show abrasion. If they all do, loosen up a little bit. If most of them, and I mean over 90% do not show abrasion, then set it down a little bit. Now, the other uh, situation that most of you have is the intermeshing rolls. Uh, is anybody using steel rolls here? Okay, everybody's using rubber rolls. How many are using rubber rolls? Okay, how many don't know what they're using? Because <laughs> there's a few of you who didn't raise your hand. <laughs> anyway, um, with the intermeshing rollers, you want at least 90% of the stems to show bends. And in fact, with alfalfa at least, and a couple of you make that, I like to see a little bit of bruising on the leaves, one to two or three percent. If I don't see any bruising, I'm probably not conditioning enough. Now you have two settings on your uh, uh, rollers. Uh, the first one is roll spacing, how close those rolls are together. 
and um, we basically suggest about 330 seconds of an end for very high yields or thick stems. So if you do a sorghum sedan grass or some of those bigger stem crops, a little wider spacing is a good idea. About a sixteenth, eighth, maybe up to an eighth of an inch for lower yields and finer stems. All of our cool season grasses, our warm season grasses, should be fairly close setting. Now the way that we can tell the setting is to take a piece of aluminum foil from your kitchen, about a foot square, roll it up to about an inch diameter roll, make three of them, and feed them through the conditioner, one in the middle and one on each side. And then you measure that thin part, and it should be that six eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch, or whatever it's supposed to be. Now, a couple times I would advise you to do this. The first thing is, is when you first get your new machine, check it. Maybe all of your dealers are pretty good here about setting up the machines, but I have seen machines delivered to farmers where the distance was one amount on one end and a different one on the other. <laughs> um, so check to make sure they're set right to start with. Then I recommend putting these three through once a year and eventually with your rubber rolls the middle will start to have a wider spacing than either edge. At some time when that spacing in the middle gets to be about twice the spacing on the outside edge, you should think about replacing the conditioner or the rolls or whatever because you can't tighten the edges enough anymore to get good conditioning in the middle. Now, <laughs> our safety people tell me that you should shut off the mower before you do this and then feed them through manually and check the distance. But it's a lot more exciting if you don't. They just kind of shoot right on through and out the back. <laughs> But be careful. <laughs> anyway, so you adjust the roll spacing and then you adjust the pressure. We've got the roll spacing. Uh, the pressure should be adjusted again so that you have the appropriate amount of broken stems and a little bit of leaf bruising. Uh, I've been on some farms where the person didn't know how to adjust the tension. I asked one farmer, he said, well, I've got a manual here somewhere. And I'm saying, well, you should be doing this several times per harvest as your yield goes up, as your crop changes, if you really want good conditioning. <coughs> so in summary, begin with a wide swath. Conditioning is necessary for hay, but not for haylage if you're going to put it up at 60% moisture. I know some of you talk about wrapping what we call sweet hay or the drier stuff. That would still need to be conditioned. Uh, conditioned with a roller for alfalfa, conditioned with an impeller for flail. But having said that, most of you told me you're using rollers. They work great for grasses. Now, a few other things to keep in mind is that Every time you move hay, you lose yield. Every time. So the principle that you should follow is to move your hay as little as possible from mowing to baling. And uh, the second thing that along with that is that the wetter your hay is when you move it, the less your yield loss and leaf loss. And so if we look at this table here, what this is showing is that if we rake or tend our hay above 50% moisture, our yield loss is 2 or 3%. That's not too bad. If we wait until it gets down to 33% or drier, then we're starting to see a yield loss of 7 to 10% per operation. And of course, your loss is primarily leaves, so you're losing your quality portion of your yield. So it, it really is significant to think about trying to do the operations with the forage a little bit wetter. So even if you're making hay for grass, I'm going to suggest you mow in the morning if you've got a bright sunny day, ten late in the evening or afternoon or next morning at the latest. 
and then rake it either at the end of the second day or the beginning of the third. But think about doing it a little on the wet side so that your leaf loss is less. Now, if you're making baleage, then skip the tedding. Mow it in the morning, you should be down to about 60. Like I say, in our case, and I, I'll bet you yours, because you actually have more sunlight than I do, we can make baleage 70 or 80% of the time the same day we cut it. So then mow it, rake it, bale it for baleage. Does that make sense to everybody? And so I, I will say too then, this is where we get a little higher quality and yield with the baleage than we do with hay. Because when you let the hay get drier, the leaves get brittle and they break. Any of you that have walked behind your round balers making hay, and I'm not being critical, doesn't make any difference what color they are. <laughs> any of you that walk behind your baler, you can see pieces falling off as the bale is turning. And you would see fewer pieces on baleage than you would on dry hay. So your harvesting loss is less for baleage than it is for dry hay. You with me on that? Does that make, this is just pure physics. This, um, so think about doing tillage. Uh, leaf loss <laughs> is, is really the crucial thing. You, you know, you're really harvesting leaves. And when you look at, at your hay, like a cool season grass in the spring with stems, you should have had about 50% leaves and 50% stems. If you look at your hay bales and it's two-thirds stems, you've lost that much leaves. So think about that a little bit. Um, the other thing I will say to you is that while there are some differences among machines in terms of minimizing leaf loss, Again, the biggest factor is the adjustment on the machine. How fast you're driving the tractor, how much you're adjusting that uh, machine to throw the hay around, those are bigger factors than the color of your rake. <laughs> um, the other thing I want you to think about, what do you think of this wind roll? Huh? Is it a good one, bad one? Too narrow. too narrow. Of course, this is right before bailing. Well, so yes, it's still too narrow. So I made this though. I'm kind of offended. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something else wrong with this wind roll. And he's exactly right. His comment was it's too narrow. And, and your wind roll should be as wide as the pickup on your baler. So that's, you're right, absolutely. <laughs> but there's another thing. Well, let's look at a couple more. What do you think of this wind roll? What do you think of that one? Scared to answer now, aren't you? <laughs> so, so I like these wind rolls on the right a little bit more. Uh, the middle one may look a tad bunchy, but it isn't, which would be a problem. Um, but they're, they're fluffy, they're the width of your pickup roughly, it's hard to see scale here. Uh, the one on the upper left is basically a little bit too ropey. It's pushed together too much, it isn't gonna dry good. And I would say that that's one I made, oh I always forget the term used, with parallel bars or a basket rake, or what do you call those rakes here? What? Roller bar. Roller bar, thank you, I never can remember that. <laughs> I grew up with a roller bar, and they're not a bad rake. But if you're not careful with them, they'll make wind rows that really look pretty, like on the upper left. But it's not a good idea for bailing, and it's not a good idea for drying. So, uh, for drying hay, Ted grass, and uh, in, I would say, 12 to 24 hours after. Uh, grass, you need to Ted. Legumes, you don't. The reason is that grass goes down to a thick mat, and if you don't fluff it up once, it won't really dry very good. So for grass, for hay, we mow it, 
We tend it generally, I would say, the same day or the latest the next morning, and then we rake it either late on the second day or early the third day, depending on the amount of sunlight that we've had. Again, always try to be a little on the wet side. Tending for legumes is a bad idea. Um, I, you see the leaves that are being thrown off here? Not a good idea. Okay, I'm running out of time. I'm, I want to hurry through just a couple more things here. Um, uh, let's, so a couple things about raking. Um, first off, we should always rake so the tines minimally touched. Yes, sir. I have a question about tedding. Uh, last year we had, uh, we were challenged in some wet times, and we replanted the tedding time down by I sent a man out with a ted rake when the uh, when the mower was halfway through the field. Tedding it too soon is that doing any damage to that? Doing what too soon? I'm sorry. Is tedding too soon? Heading too soon, no, it's not a problem. Okay. Um, right, so some people tend right after mowing even. I don't recommend it because that's kind of a slow process. It's extra traffic and so on. I like to wait a few hours because then it makes a fluffier swath. But there's no time limit. It's just waiting a little bit gives you a fluffier swath. Um, Raking to the middle is important. Uh, I know that the most common rake here is the uh, wheel rake there on the uh, left, right, <laughs> the yellow one. Um, and, and a couple of things I'd like to say about that. First off, most people are setting those too deep and they're scraping too much dirt and stones into the hay. Trying to get the tonnage up, yeah, that's right. Which is okay if you're selling it, it's not such a good idea if you're feeding it, you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, but do think about that. The machinery industry tells me their biggest expense with rakes is bent and broken teeth. Now, if you weren't touching the ground too, digging too deep, and I've been in fields where people have had their wheel rakes dig a couple inches into the ground, that's not a good idea. Adjust your wheel rake for hay so that you have about 20 pounds of weight on a wheel. Take your bathroom scale out there and adjust it. There's, most rakes are settings with notches or screws or something to reduce your tension either of a gang or of individual wheels. 20 pounds for hay. Now if you're going to baleage, then these wheel rakes don't work so well because they don't work on heavier forage. But in all cases, recognize that with a wheel rake, you're putting more dirt in your hay. I am concerned that this is where some of the botulism comes from, that we're picking up dirt and putting it in our hay. A, a rotary rake, like on the left there, if, especially if you've made a wide swath, you can set it so it never touches the ground. Well, then you don't pick up dirt and you don't put that foreign matter in there. Think about that, that's really an important thing that we don't pay enough attention to. Uh, the ash content, the whole idea is, I'll quit in a couple minutes. <laughs> the whole idea is that the, uh, we need minerals, there's minerals inside the plant, but in your grass, how many of you do forage analysis on your hay? Well good, well look at the ash content you have about three to four percent minerals in the hay. Any number on your analysis above three or four percent is dirt. So all of you should be making samples that are eight or nine percent total ash, which gives you up to six percent dirt. Are you with me? And that's important, and like I say, beyond the botulism, the issue is that those nutrients are basically silica. They provide no nutrition for the animal, and yet uh, they consume it, and, and then you have just reduced energy you're feeding them. Here's an example. I did a, some studies with uh, four different rake types, one of which was the real rake. We slipped the tarp underneath the windrow. We sampled across the width of the windrow. Look at those chunks of dirt that fell out of the windrow from the wheel rake, not from the others. Now you never see these chunks in your hay because they get broken up. 
but they're there. So think about that, and uh, I would strongly encourage that you think about something else if you want quality hay. Um, the other option would be to uh, look at your knives. The newer machines have quick detach. It used to be too much work to change the knives. <laughs> but now that they've got the quick detach, most uh, of the uh, Mowers come with an angled blade because it picks up down forage better. But if you want to keep the ash down, especially on summer cuttings, you go with a flat blade uh, because this angled blade creates a vacuum and sucks up dry dirt, especially if you're cutting too short. And that's the other thing then, your cutter height should be four inches for grasses. Four inches. The lower you go to the ground, particularly with a disc mower, it's exponential. The more suction you have there, the more dirt you pick up. But the grasses need that height because they store energy in the stem and they recover faster. So the higher cutting height gives you more yield for the year. Yes, sir? So just to elaborate on that, is your cutting height, should be the, the same height as your spot grazing height? Because it's all forage. You use those <clears throat> Well, that'd be good. I, I, what are you thinking of uh, stopping grazing? What's your height for that? Three, four inches. Yeah, so, so same reason. Now, the advantage of grazing is it's not going to be uniform, so you'll have a few longer leaves, which is good. But absolutely, a four-inch height should be your minimum. Less dirt on the mowing, faster regrowth, and higher yield for the season for all the same reasons that your grazing height is. That's a good comment. All right. Um, I think uh, I'm out of time, you're telling me, right? Dan, I'll give you uh, four or five more minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really sensitive to that. Uh, yeah, I like to know when to start, but it's really important to know when to stop. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes they put me up against lunch, and I'm holding up the lunch menu if I don't quit. But that's not the case today. We've got some other things going on. Uh, a couple things about drying it and making hay that you may not have thought of. Um, one of the th changes that has occurred is we're making bigger bales. The bigger the bale, the drier the hay needs to be. When we used to make small square bales, we could bale as wet as 20% moisture and stack them loose and they would dry. When we go to a round bale, <laughs> that's uh, say four feet by five, we can maybe put that up at 16. If we go to a five foot by five, it needs to be 15%. The point is, if you're making dry hay, the bigger the bale, the drier the hay has to be. And that's something machinery guys usually don't tell you. Also, the bigger the bale or the bigger tractor you probably need, but that's another issue. Um, <clears throat> so. If we're making a half ton bale, which is a three by three foot bale uh, square, that would be 16%. If we go to a one ton bale, it needs to be down around 14. This is why with square bales, the four by four foot bales are only made in the west where the humidity is low because we can't get hay to 14%. They can. Uh, you can use propionic acid to preserve the hay. And I'll talk about this later on. There are some nice tools for both square and round balers for applying preservative in relation to the moisture of the hay. But the other thing to keep in mind just quickly, and I will end after this slide, um, <coughs> is that um, the moisture at which you can put up hay in a bale depends on several things. And, and um, of course, it, the drying isn't as good as we said with, with sunlight low, humidity high, and so on. It is important to remember that under poor drying conditions, um, the, uh, the, the management has less effect. Let me, uh, I think we'll just go on here. So a couple things to keep in mind. Smaller bale, you can make it wetter. Cooler weather, you can make a wetter bale, so you can make a better a little bigger, wetter bale in May than you can in July or August because you're looking at heat transfer and the, the greater the difference in temperature between the bale and the air, the better the heat transfers out. 
So there are some options there that we can think about and, and we'll talk about that. I think with that I'll end for now and then we'll see you again after lunch. <laughs>